Well, we're fussed up, and uh, I think we've uh, come up with a um, sitting next to me a rather, what I might call a hard act to uh, follow. Um, Andy Harris uh, is, uh, uh, has been for many years award-winning uh, producer, Oscar nominee, uh, award-winning producer of uh, comedy and drama. Um, I guarantee you that even if you're not aware of it, you will have seen at least one of his shows, probably uh, many of them. We're going to show a few clips in the next, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk to Andy uh, about uh, his career. We're going to try and keep it quite nuts and bolts. We're going to try and talk about what, uh, uh, what um, Andy actually does for a living every day. Um, I, I, actually, very early in my career, actually, I was, I was standing on a drama set and, and, and uh, um, waiting for something to happen, which is what you usually do on a drama set. Uh, and, uh, and a young, very nice young man who was a runner, who was working for the assistant director's department, sort of came up and sort of stood beside me. And after about five minutes, he turned to me and said, excuse me, he said, what do you actually do? Um, and I saw I explained I was the producer. And he said, yes, I know that. He said, but what do you actually do? So we're going to try and answer that question. Anyway, Andy, let's, um, let's go back to the beginning because you were not... Well, actually, before we do that, can I just ask, who here... Uh, I know you're all uh, media students and so you all have a kind of a desire to work in different kinds of media. Who here would describe themselves at the moment as having a burning desire to work in television specifically? Okay, not everyone. And of those who want to work in television, who really wants to work in drama? Right, good. Well, the rest of you can go for a cup of coffee, then, <laughs> to be honest. But anyway, let's... let's well, actually, we might take that. We might, have, we might have that poll again at the end and see, uh, and see how many people's... Uh, we've seen. So, Andy, um, look, uh, The Crown, more recently, uh, Wallander, Strike Back, a whole kind of uh, list of hits. But you didn't, um, you didn't start out... Actually, Wikipedia tells me that, that font of knowledge and, and truth. It uh, tells me you actually wanted to be a war correspondent. Um, <laughs> is that true? I did. I did. I, 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 uh, I, I always wanted... The only thing I wanted to be when I was a, was a, a school kid was a, was a journalist. I was very driven by, uh, by being a news reporter and, uh, and, and, and going around the world. I, uh, and that's what fascinated me. I mean, I started writing for the school magazine when I was 10, 12, all that kind of shit. And, and I finally left school at 17 and got onto the local paper. I came from a place called Peterborough, which is about 80 miles, 100 miles up the road, and not a very interesting place, but, but uh, the local paper was quite thriving at the time, and that was my first job at 17, and that set me on the road. That's quite a long way to, <laughs> to doing the crown from that paper, I know, but that's what started me off. So you ended up, so you started out in, as print journalist, and then you got into, then you, you, then you got into TV, but still in, you were, you were in factual television, you weren't in drama straight away, were you? No, I wasn't, well, I just, a, so I, did, I spent a year, basically, between school and university. I, I, didn't, I didn't have a university post, actually, initially, because I'd rather buggered up my A-levels, and I only got, uh, I've got a D in English, if it's any encouragement for you. <laughs> but I'm also pretty poor for a journalist, but I got a job as a journalist for a year and then I realized that, that I desperately wanted to go to university and I had initially thought I wanted to study English and then I realized that I didn't that actually what I was interested in was politics because the paper the Peterborough Evening Telegraph had really radicalized me actually it was sort of working with a bunch of guys in their early 20s who really had who really had a feel of what working life was like and I somehow just hadn't it, it sort of brought something out of me which I really got excited by so I then went to Hull University which was um, great I loved Hull actually it was fantastic and uh, it, was, it was very radical, and uh, which took me even further. Uh, I, I sort of cemented my desire, I suppose, to try to, to make a difference in some shape or form. Although notions of television were still a bit far away, but I was writing, still writing stuff. And then when I came out of university, I applied for lots of jobs. It was a little, maybe a little easier to get jobs in those days, but, there were more, but it was all more formal. You had to apply to a television company like you know, one of the ITV stations or BBC or what have you. And I applied to the Thompson uh, training scheme initially. The, uh, the Thompson newspapers used to run a, a training scheme for journal journalists. And it was very hard to get into. And I, I went uh, all the way through the system and then finally got to uh, a final interview uh, for a Cardiff newspaper. And the editor said to me, he said, well, you know, why do you want to do this? And I said, oh, well, you know, my dad's Welsh. I want to go back to Wales. I've always wanted to be a journalist and blah, blah, blah. And he said, but what do you ultimately want to be? I said, well, I want to be a foreign correspondent. I want to travel the world. And... Uh, he said, wrong business. He said, paper's finished. You should forget papers. Go to television. And it was a wonderful piece of advice. And um, it, <laughs> it led to an increasing desire to, to explore um, opportunities in television. And that led me to finally landing a job at Granada, which was then a very thriving independent uh, company based in Manchester. And that's 
really what set me off. And I was 21, and I arrived in Manchester. I'd never been to Manchester in my life before. So how did so when when did comedy enter your television? Well, comedy. I've always, I did, <laughs> that was the, my greatest lo love is comedy. I love comedy. I've always loved comedy. And even though I spent my first 10 or 15 years of my working career working factual shows and documentaries and political shows. It was comedy that I always wanted to work in, but Granada didn't really have any comedy in those days, and um, not any attempt to do comedy was, was, uh, was resisted. But I, you know, I, what, what I liked watching was Monty Python and <laughs> stuff like that, and it, it, I just, comedy made me laugh. And it, weirdly, there wasn't stand-up comedy in the 70s and uh, late 70s. It, it just didn't really sort of exist. Stand-up comedy as we know it today, Soho clubs and Soho and stuff like that, that didn't start to the mid-80s. Um, and that's when I, when, and that's when that new comedy started in the mid '80s. I was, which by then I was in television properly, still making factual programmes. I mean, I used to work along with Paul Greengrass on World in Action, so we were doing heavy stuff. You know, we were going into South Africa in times of apartheid and Mozambique and Angola. I went, you know, I went to some incredibly bizarre, uh, very sad places uh, increasingly. So it was a long way from what I, it's not what I didn't want to do. I love my factual time, actually. I mean, I think making documentaries is one of the great ways to explore yourself and to explore subjects that you're interested in. I mean, that's what I love about TV. You know, you can, whatever you want to do, you can do. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, for me, making documentaries was about exploring my passions, well, going to visit Africa, going, you know, I went to Afghanistan for three months. I mean, at one point, I'll tell you a funny story, actually. This is true. So I was back when I was about 22, 23 at Granada. When I had come into Granada, one of the programs they had at that time was Disappearing World, which is a show that sadly has long disappeared. But now it's all in the archives of Manchester University. And it was a series of films made over about 15 years about tribes around the world that were disappearing. And the, the ethos of the, of the series was that the film unit, a very small film unit, would go in and live with the tribe, and there would be one person who could speak the language of the tribe, and that would be a formal anthropologist. So that anthropologist's work, in a way, was being captured on film. It was a fantastically prestigious series to work on, and I'd love watching it as a kid. So when I come into Granada, they said to me, what do you want to work on? And I said, oh yeah, disappearing world, world in action, you know, that sort of stuff. And then strangely, about a few months later, I got this call from a producer in London, very grand. And it was, life was rather more formal in television in those days. And he said, is that Andy Harris? I said, yes, he said. And he said, oh, it's uh, Dr. Andre Singer from Disciplined World in London. And I understand you're very interested in Disciplined World. And I said, yes. He said, well, we have a vacancy. It's come up rather short notice. And I wondered if you'd be available to work on a show. I said, well, yes, I'd love to. He said, well, I, would you like to spend the time, would, how would you feel about going to the Northwest frontier for Christmas? Right, now, I came from Peterborough, okay, that's just sort of in the fens, all right? I had only been in Manchester about a year or so. Behind me was a great big map of the northwest of England, okay? So when he said the northwest front, <laughs> I, he said, yes, I'm afraid you'll have, to spend the, you'll have to spend Christmas in the Khyber Pass. This is what I did. I'm serious. I said, that sounds great. Really, the Khyber Pass, that sounds fantastic. Preston, Lancashire, Perth, can't wait. <laughs> Yes, you can live and learn in TV very fast. <laughs> the late, yeah. So you're, uh, you're the late, the late district was yes, your sort uh, of, uh, yes, anyway, yeah, I your went, early I went uh, assignment. Past Christmas. But you did events. Okay, so you eventually <laughs> got to Granada. You actually, your ticket into Granada, uh, into Granada comedy was was uh, was actually a play at the Edinburgh Tele yes. at the Edinburgh uh, Festival, um, an evening with Gary Lineker. Yes. So well, that was, that was a little while later. So. Yeah. I sort of left, I, 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 to finish the, the initial years of Granada, where I was basically a factual and a presenter for a while, I mean, what I want to say to you, if you were interested in television, you do not have to decide at this stage of the game what you want to do in TV. I have literally done almost everything, and I mean everything. And many, many people have told me I had no future in television, I've been fired many times, and I've had a, a very up and down career. And one of my biggest disasters was being a TV presenter. I was literally put on screen for three months. And You're so good looking, it's surprising. <laughs> And it ended in total humiliation with me being fired at the end of a show where I had completely and utterly buggered up this live, uh, uh, you know, show. It was the evening news. I was like, hello, good evening, welcome to Granada Reports tonight. Anyway, I did, the whole thing was a complete cock-up. I rehearsed the news in seven minutes and read it in three. I didn't, I just went on and on. And, I, and literally that moment at the end of the studio, the lights went down and the producer said, uh, Andy Harris, would you go upstairs to see you? This guy called Steve Morrison, who was the boss. And oh, I, scary. And, yeah, scary. <laughs> we all know Steve. Way. And that was it. Anyway, so, you know, there are many times when the, when the career's gone up and down and up and down and up and down. So, um, and, you know, I've worked in entertainment. I've done shiny floor stuff. You know, I, you name it. I've done it. So I don't think it matters doing lots of different things until you finally settle. You know, I was a director for a long time, a factual director. I thought I wanted to be a drama director. I went to Hollywood. I sat around in Hollywood with my pals. 
thinking I was going to be a movie director. And it, you know, it took some time to finally the, the, the kind of you know the kind of eyes the, to fall from the scales to fall from my eyes to realise what I really was good at, which was producing. Yeah. And what was producing? Well, producing was a bit of everything, a bit yeah. of you know. What have you. So, okay, sorry. we're going to. That's okay. <laughs> that's right. We're going to go. We're gonna, we, we could be here all day, actually. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the first clip. So this is. We, we're, you're now working. Um, this is. This is the royal family. So this is. You're working in Granada. Yes. And uh, well, let's just show the clip first. And I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, so this is a. Uh, this is a um, moment. Um, uh, uh, we're going to show a little clip from the royal family. You might have seen this before. I certainly have. Let's go. <laughs> Words like original and groundbreaking, and uh, all, all the time about television programs, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not. But the royal family was—I mean, there was there had nothing been nothing like it really before, and I'm not sure there's been anything really like it since. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how it, how it came about? I mean, was it um, how and how you and Caroline first kind of encountered one another? Yeah, I mean, the sad thing is that Caroline Hearn's not in that clip. She. It's hard. You know, she was one of the most extraordinary talented people I've ever met in my life. She was about 23, 24 when I first met her. She was doing a little bit of stand-up in Manchester. And she had a sort of extraordinary quality. She had, she was first generation Irish, Catholic, and, 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 and essentially, quintessentially Mancunian. And it's an extraordinary mix. You know, Ma Manchester's a fantastic place. I don't come from Manchester, but I loved Manchester, actually. I love the culture. I love the music in Manchester. It's a very distinct city. And... Um, and the royal family is, has this, it, 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 the, the roots of the royal family are this combination of her Irish ancestry and, and, and this sort of wry Mancunian sense of humour that you have with the Gallaghers and Oasis and all that, and Oasis did the theme tune and all that kind of stuff. And it was just an extraordinary time, I thought, in Manchester. And, uh, I mean, I could, you know, literally could talk for days about Caroline because uh, you rarely does one meet a piece of talent that seems so extraordinary, so precious, so brilliant, and also so incredibly difficult. Mm. It had the most torturous relationship. She would ban me from the set at times. She wouldn't speak to me for months. And then other times, you know, it, would, it was, was fantastic. I mean, she was a very, very precious talent. She did an enormous amount of looking after. Her, her love life was chaotic. I could never avoid her, I would never help her when she would just steer from one terrible guy to another terrible guy. And in the end, the, the pressures of fame and, 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 and money and just all came, became too much and she, she fled. I don't know how much you know about Caroline's story. It was an extraordinary story, but the work was, was brilliant. It started with Mrs. Merton. She, she, Mrs. Merton was a character that she had created as a little stand-up figure. And when I arrived, at Gr I went back to Granada. This was, I suppose, the thing. I went back to Granada 10 years after I'd left. 
to be head of comedy, uh, and they didn't have any comedy. It was the wonderful title, be head of nothing, really, but head of, in a sense, everything. That was the brilliant thing. And Manchester was just full, teeming with talent. So Steve Coogan, John Thompson, Carolina Hearn, who I met literally in the first week. And I, I just thought, fucking hell, this is just unbelievable. I mean, they're just unbelievable. They just made me laugh like a drain. And I just thought, I've got to... I just got to work with that. I just got to work with these people. It's just it's incredible. So the Mrs. Merton show was very successful, but Caroline hated live performance. She just used to drink herself into a sort of semi-state. You had to get on and get the show, get her through the show before she basically passed out. Uh, so it was difficult. And as each Mrs. Merton series went on, I knew we had. Well, she knew as much as me that she had to find a new vehicle. And what she wanted to do, what became the royal family. And she did, she, I did a deal with the BBC to develop something new. It was a blind deal. So actually, I went to see Alan Yentob and Michael Jackson, who were running the BBC at the time. They wanted, of course, more and more Mrs. Merton. I said, do one more series, but she's got, she needs a, a blind deal to do something new. And they said, fine, 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 whatever it is, fine. And I said to Caroline, fine, you've got, you know, you've got, here's the money, you can do what you want to do. And she delivered me this script one day. She just came in, she said, there you are, that's the script. That's what we want to do. And here's the cast. She gave me the cast list. And I promise you, the cast list exactly was as we cast it. And the script was as we made it. She said, I don't want any bloody script editors coming around telling me. I said, I'm not interested in any notes. Or you, Andy, no notes. And I, she said, uh, uh, what she'd done is she's put in little jokes to see if I'd read the whole, re read the whole script. Because <laughs> one of the odd things about someone as a drama and a comedy you know, producer is I'm slightly dyslexic. So actually reading is a bit of a problem for me. Uh, which, which is a bit odd because I deal with scripts all the time. But I don't really like reading scripts, which is, a, which is a, I mean, I do enjoy, I enjoy reading scripts, but I find it quite difficult. So uh, I've often been tested to see if I've read the damn script. So Caroline will put jokes in on page 60. He's still with us, Andy, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> anyway, the, it, was, it was like 20 pages long. And I said, well, this guy said, you know, I said, and she, was, she had pause here, pause there. I, I, I thought initially it was a joke. And then I understood what she wanted to make, which was a real life show. She wanted to do the whole show in real time. And this is, was the heart of the show. This was the, this, this was the concept of the show, that the, damn thing, the whole thing was in real time. So when the family was sitting on the sofa and one of them wanted, wanted to go to the bathroom, we would literally, in the studio, count out as they get up, get, pretend to have go to the bathroom and come back again. I mean, it was that, the need for that was that accurate. Um, and... Uh, there was a quietness and a stillness. I mean, because the BBC at the time said, oh, no, no, we've got to have an audience. You can't have a sitcom without an audience. You've got to put it in front of an audience. And Caroline completely refused. She didn't want to perform in front of an audience. So that was a very tense battle. And many a person at the BBC, some gone, some not, told me it would, the show would be a disaster. And uh, it would never work without an audience. And it would never work in this style. What they were actually interested in and this was, uh, this was something... In fact, initially, we did, we did do a trial. She, Caroline did actually try it, with, not so much in an audience, but she wanted to do it in the studio. So the very first show of The Royal Family was shot in a studio. But I realised it wasn't what she wanted. What she really wanted was Ken Loach. She was obsessed with Ken Loach. Ken Loach did an amazing film called Raining Stones, which some of you may have seen if you're interested in film. It's a really interesting... Again, shot in Manchester, constantly raining. It's a fascinating film. And she was obsessed with that film, and that's what she wanted. She wanted a Ken Loach approach to a, to a comedy. And um, so we started the recording in the studio with a studio director. So it was like a sort of studio sitcom without the sitcom. And after five, ten minutes, I stopped the show. And I went downstairs down to the studio floor and to see Caroline and Craig Cash, who was a creative partner. And I said, look, just come upstairs and watch this for five minutes. And I watched it, played it back. And I said, is that what you really want? And they went, oh, no. I said, I know, I know it's not. I said, let's stop this. Let's just, let's just stop this. Let's start over. Let's get a film camera, a film director, shoot it on film. Let's go and do it in a little in stop. We did it in a little, initially in a little studio in Stockport. And, uh, and that's how, how we found the form of the film. And it was a lot of it was in the editing, of course, because it was about long pauses, wasn't it? They were sitting watching the telly. How long do you leave it before you, you put the, the clips in? And, and that must have been quite, I mean, I mean, that must have been quite scary because, I mean, they're kind of one of the rules is, oh, you know, I mean, you know, people, you know, have long pauses on television yeah. shows, people switch off or they go, they switch over to another channel. So, I mean, it was, I mean, just could talk a little bit more. When you have someone like Caroline, who is remarkable genius, yeah. really, but, and, and you were saying, you know, she's like, I don't want any script services, I don't want any notes from you, whatever. So, so as a producer, you know, how do you, I mean, how do you work out when, and yes, at the same time, you kind of said, look, you know, you kind of realised this wasn't working, and you went, so how do you decide well, it's, when to intervene and when not to intervene? How does that... 
Well, that's, that's what it's works. all about, it's judgment, isn't it? I mean, the, th the thing, I've been to Las Vegas many, many times. I've filmed in Las Vegas. I, I don't gamble. I cannot gamble. I just, there's nothing in me that wants to put a piece of a penny in a slot machine or sit at a card table or any form of gambling doesn't interest me at all. Why? It's because I gamble every day. I am permanently gambling. That's all I do is gambling. I'm taking a risk of every decision I make, pretty much, and some of them are very big decisions and some are not. And every single day, I mean, I've just come from my office now, should we hire this director? Should we do that? Should we hire this DOP, that guy? Should we go with this writer, that writer? Should we put the set, should we film it in South Africa or film it in East Anglia? You know, these are constant decisions that you're having to make, and it's all about judgment, and it's all about trying to get maximum impact, maximum quality, and minimise your risk. Because everything is risk. That's the truth. And creative, we're in the creative process. And that's what juices you up all day long. Um, OK. We're going to have to scoot along. Because one of the weird things, Andy, is he, he doesn't... He, he, I know for a fact that this man has been in television at least as long as me. And yet he looks 20 years younger, which is just unfair. So he has actually had a much longer career than it looks it's possible for him to have. So we're going to have to scoot through. So you, you then became controller of drama. Uh, at Granada, you kind of bro broadened out. The fools gave me the keys. They gave you the keys to, yes. the, to, to the kingdom. And they, they and gave me the keys because I wanted to do something desperately. And, and, and this is what it was. I was at Granada. They didn't really want to give me the drama job, but I've been successful at the comedy job. And the drama chief left. So they were very hesitant, but they gave it to me. And the reason they gave it to me is because I said to them I wanted to bring back Prime Suspect. And I wanted to bring back Prime Suspect because I had a bit of an obsession with Helen Mirren. I thought she was the greatest actress in the UK. I'd never met her. I just watched Prime Suspect as a kid, and I thought, I want to work with Helen. And Prime Suspect hadn't been made for seven years. But Granada's drama department had the rights. So in a way, you, know, you had the rights. I had the rights to try to make it. And so I went, so that's what I said. So I went, so I pitched this at the interview, and they said, all right, you can have the job. But uh, you know, and if you can get Prime Suspect back, so much the better. And it wasn't easy, but I, I did it. And I did it having lots and lots of cups of tea with Helen Mirren around all the posh hotels in London. And then, and then so two strands of your Granada career kind of come together because you've also developed a relationship with Peter Morgan and yes. did The Deal, which is the story about Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in an Islington restaurant kind of deciding, yep. you know, who's going to run the Labour Party, which Peter yep. wrote. Was that, and was it, that was originally a stage play or it was originally? No, 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 no. That, was a, that was one of Peter's ideas. Right. So Peter's a fascinating person. Okay? I met Peter when he was 23 years old. He'd just come out of Leeds University. Uh, he, I, I, I can't quite remember what he studied now. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. He came down to London. We, we shared an agent together. This is how I met Peter. I was trying to do a movie about set in Zimbabwe featuring Lenny Henry as a taxi driver. I wanted to remake Hard Day's Night with a, a band at the time called the Bundu Boys, who were a little uh, South, uh, Zimbabwean beat band. They were f great. And I thought I had this mad idea that they'd take the Bundu Boys, who were real, and put Lenny Henry down there. Lenny Henry was a very big star in the late 80s, uh, as a kind of manager, hapless manager, who would bring them to London, and they'd be a complete disaster. And then at the last minute, of course, they'd be a huge success. That was, the, that was the concept. And I sold this idea to a film company in London. And I, I desperately needed a, 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 a writer. And I went to see my agent. There was a young lady called Nikki. And I went into her office, and I had a couple of pages like this. And I said, look, this is a great idea. I've got money to develop the script. I've just got to find a writer. So you've got to find me a writer. And writers are, it's, it's what it's all about. Writers are all about writers. We'll come back to writers in a minute. Anyway, I literally, I said, can you please, please, please find me a writer, because I've got money. And literally 10 minutes later, she said, uh, she phones me. She said, I found your writer. I said, how can you do that so fast? She said, well, I found you, right? His, his name's Peter Morgan. And what basically happened, of course, is I'd left her office with this on the desk. And five minutes later, Peter Morgan had come in, and she'd gone up to go to the bathroom, and he'd come, well, gone around the desk, read it all, and then she came back and said, I'll do that. And uh, <laughs> so I met Peter, and I, and, uh, I, and I, uh, oh, no, I liked him. He, he was very smart. And uh, I said, well, have you been to Africa before? He said, no, no, I've never been to Africa. I said, well, well you can't write this. You haven't been to Africa. <sighs> God, I said, well, I'll have to send you to Zimbabwe. And I found a, a flight via Bulgaria, which was incredibly cheap. And I sent him off to Bulgaria, <laughs> sent him off to Zimbabwe. And anyway, he wrote the script, and it was the start of our relationship. Now, we're still working together now, 25 years or so, maybe even more later. Uh, 1987, what is that? It's 30 years, isn't it? So this is a... Time. So let's have, I think this is a good moment to go to the second clip. So this is, this is the Queen, this is the which queen. brings together two yes. of your sort of strands of your granola, right? the Helen Mirren strand and the Peter Morgan strand yes. come together. And this is, um, so this is the story, well, why don't you just briefly set up, so this is, this is about uh, the Queen's relationship with 
Blair and the death of Diane. Well, the link with Helen Mirren and the prime suspect was this. At the very first read-through of Prime Suspect 6, which was the show that I brought back, when Helen came into the room, uh, she, she, I mean, she lives in many places of the world, mostly in America, um, and she hadn't been in London for quite a long time, so there was sort of mill of the usual people there at her. Uh, it was a, Prime Suspect, a big show. It's a big read-through, lots of actors, makeup, all the usual people. And then Helen came into the room. There was sort of an aura of the arrival. You know, I, I just noticed that people sort of to the bow. <laughs> nice. Like this. And I was just watching that. I thought, Jesus Christ, she's like the goddamn bloody queen, isn't she? She's amazing. And that thought sort of permeated. And as she sat down in front of me, in front of me on the read through, I just looked at her and I thought, Christ, she even looks a bit like the queen. Not the queen. She's not, she's not the same age as the queen. But what I meant was the queen in the Diana years. And the Diana years, or the Diana's death, I should say, was something that both Peter Morgan and I were very affected by, as we all were, well, well, people of a certain age were in this country, but it was a very dramatic week for us, because that was the week that Peter got married. And um, he got married on the day that she was um, buried, and the funeral was live on the bus going down. Uh, we were in Austria. Peter was marrying an Austrian in the castle. And the, the bus that drove us down to the wedding, uh, I was the best man, had the funeral all the way down on the on the bus. So somehow Diana and Diana's death and the extraordinary circumstances around Diana's death had permeated into our. It's just uh, yeah, and you, I'm sure when you were in London. Let's, time, exactly. Anyway, I know I'm it. Let's 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 run the, the idea. Let's run the clip and then we can talk a bit more about uh, the Queen. Hi, up here. Your tea is getting cold. Is that it? Uh, yes, ma'am. Just the letter of condolence to the widow of the ambassador to Brazil. Apparently, the Prime Minister is on the phone for you. Tell him to call back. No, no, it's all right. I'll take it. Prime Minister. Good morning, Your Majesty. Sorry to disturb, but I was just wondering whether you'd seen any of today's papers. We've managed to look at one or two, yes. might be necessary. No. I believe a few over-eager editors are doing their best to sell newspapers, and it would be a mistake to dance to their tune. Under normal circumstances, I would agree. But, well, my advisors have been taking the temperature among people on the streets, and, well, the information I'm getting is that the mood So, what would you suggest, Prime Minister? Some kind of a statement? No, ma'am. I believe the moment for statements has passed. I would suggest flying the flag at half-mast above Buckingham Palace. And... Coming down to London at the earliest opportunity. It would be a great comfort to your people and would help them with their grief. Their grief? Do you imagine I'm going to drop everything and come down to London before I attend to my grandchildren who've just lost their mother? Then you're mistaken. I doubt there is anyone who knows the British people more than I do, Mr. Blair, nor who has greater faith in their wisdom and judgment. And it is my belief that they will any moment reject this this mood, which is being stirred up by the press, in favor of a period of restrained grief and sober private mourning. That's the way we do things in this country, quietly, with dignity. It's what the rest of the world has always admired us for. If that's your decision, ma'am, of course the government will support it. Let's keep in touch. Yes, let's. Bloody fool. 
Well, now your tea's gone cold. I mean, what I love that about that is it's just it's, it's all the incidental detail, the, the, the tea and the polishing the glasses yes. and arra you know, the kind of anx anxious arranging of yeah. the pens on the, on the blotter. It's just brilliant. Um, um, so a, a scene like that, I mean, with a, you know, you're working with someone, uh, Peter, and I, mean, you know, I imagine you know, I mean, a lot of what you've done is, is very research-based, but that's a conversation. I mean, how, how do you begin to construct a conversation? I mean, that's a conversation between the Prime Minister and the Queen. I mean, that's, that's, that's not written down anywhere. That's not recorded anywhere. So how, how do you go about, what, when, or how does Peter go about constructing a scene like that where you, you, know, you have a sense of what, you obviously must have a sense of what that conversation is about, but you don't really know. Well, that is the brilliance of Peter Morgan, to be honest with you, he, to breathe life in, and to make sense of contemporary history. I mean, that's, that is the thing that he discovered when he came up with the idea of doing the deal, which was the first of, the, the first of, of all the work that, really, that he's continued to do. Um, you know, he had originally been a sort of, he would describe himself often as a comedy writer, you know, when I'm, I mean, although I met him early in, when we were in LA in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, he was doing a lot of rewrites on movies, comedy movies, all sorts of bits and bobs. He just, he hadn't quite found his voice. And I think as a writer, um, you know, the, the, you can find your voice at different times. Peter was always a great writer, but he hadn't, but his voice came when he suddenly, with the, with the deal, and then it really found flowered with the Queen, you know. The, the Queen wasn't the easiest movie to, to, to construct. I'm, it, well, you know, that notion of seeing Helen had given me the idea, and I phoned Peter and said, let's do something about the Queen, which was a great idea, but actually that wasn't what the, the film was about. The film was about the Queen and Tony Blair, and that's what Peter worked out, that if he brought, in a sense, Tony Blair back into the mix, um, and, 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 and it was about the two of them, that relationship and the tension of that week. It's really interesting. I watched the BBC documentary a few weeks ago when, on the Diana's death, the principal one, which, which was the construct of what happened that week. And the construct of what happened that week is the construct of that film. And that film, we dug that out. We found that. Nobody did, no, I mean, of course it all happened, but no one had put it all together, as Peter had, had done. And it took months of research. We you know we met cabinet ministers, ex-cabinet ministers, you know, people inside the palace. We have huge numbers of people who talk to us privately, off the record, over a cup of tea or whatever it is. You know, the Crown has ten researchers now at any one time. You know, really, we get the best, the best of the researchers come to us and work with us for a couple of, you know, a couple of seasons. And it's, it, it's, so the research is phenomenal. But Peter's ability to process this information, the facts. So what he does, instead of having a writer's room, Peter has a... Uh, I mean, this started on the Queen and now it's on the Crown. He has a researcher's room. So he meets his researchers every day, depending on what stage we're at, but if, it is, if it's writing every day or every other day, and he, you know, he has them and they, and they're, so we're doing Princess Margaret and blah, 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 and they throw in ideas, potential scenes, potential storylines, incidents that are true. Everything has to be basically factually true. That's not to say everything in the shows are all true. Of course, Peter does cuts corners and inevitably, dramatically, has to shorten stuff and, and has to jump to keep the narrative going. But it, essentially, it's all drawn from, 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 from an absolute reality and a truth. And, of course, it's heavily legal, let me tell you. you know, it's heavily legal. I can imagine. We're going to come back to The Crown uh, in, in a moment uh, later. But the Queen is also a kind of... The Queen also represents a watershed moment in your career, doesn't it? Because it's at this point that you decide, uh, to, uh, around this moment, you decide to leave Granada. Yeah. Now, I mean, you, you know, you, you, your, your control of drama at Granada, probably well, the, the, the largest and, and certainly the, the ITV company with, you know, the most reputation, resources, I imagine you're on a pretty good salary by now. You've probably got a pension scheme. And, you know, for a lot of people, they think, hey, I'm on top of the world here. I've got, I've got, I've got, I, you know, I've got, I, I can do pretty much what I want. I've got, you know, I, I the resources of ITV behind me. I've got a great job and a good salary. I'm, you know, I, I can just carry on doing, you know, you've done a lot of good stuff. You can, so why, at that point, why throw it all up in the air to go and set up <laughs> left bank pictures? Well, what, and what, three what, kids as well. <laughs> and three, three kids as well, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, why not? Be well, because in the end, it's just another gamble, isn't it? What, yeah. the, what the fuck? Why should, you know, the, the government had created a situation where the ownership of programmes, the IP, as it's called, uh, was returned to independent companies. And this happened in the 90s, mid-90s. I had a lot of friends in, um, who had already set up companies. Some were successful, some were not. 
But it was a wonderful opportunity to, 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 to actually set up your company. And if you were successful, you would own that IP. If you own that IP, therefore your company would have value. And you could eventually possibly sell it. I didn't set up a company to sell it because uh, that, wasn't what, that wasn't an end game. My desire was to set up a company to make more of the shows I wanted to make, but do them in the way I wanted to make, and to manage uh, people in a way that I, I wanted to, because I felt at the time, and it's a bit boring now, but at the time the ITV management were very poor. Uh, I felt they were very institutionalised. I don't, they didn't, they didn't understand uh, how important production was. They were moving away from production, if you can get your head around this, but they really were. They didn't. They, they thought the value was of ITV at that time was in the commercials and in in in. in you know, different aspects of the company. They didn't understand how important production was and they didn't care for it. So I thought, well, you know, if you don't care for it, fuck you, basically. And, uh, <laughs> and I walked out uh, after giving an interview to The Guardian that, where they nearly fired me for describing it as a shambles. I can't quite remember what my descriptor was. But, I mean, I was very frustrated. And uh, um, it's hard. You, you know, all of what you say was true. I had loved my time at ITV. I had a great access to, a, to titles like Prime Suspect and a great ability to get stuff off. But in a way, the greatest challenge was to set up your own company and to do it for yourself. And I, one of the things I do like doing, and, if, and this is not for everybody, but I do like selling shows. I love selling shows. It's one of the most fun you can have, is getting out on the road and selling shows, whether they're my ideas or someone else's. I think it's great fun. So we're gonna go, I'm conscious of time, so we're gonna go to, th this takes us neatly to the next clip. And, and, and obviously, um, just to set this clip up, I mean, obviously one of the other reasons why you wanted to leave Granada and set up an independent production company was that you wanted to do more programs which were meaningful and had a sense of purpose and yes. something to do. So shall we just run the next clip, you know, which is one, uh, an example of uh, Left Bank uh, production. I got three on our tail. What are you doing? Trying to hit the tires. We'll bloody hit them then. Then keep it steady, asshole. <laughs> Two down, one to go. Make this piece of shit go any faster. Do you want to drive? I'm kind of busy. Hold on. I've got an idea. <laughs> That works. What are you doing? Dialogue. That's why I love the dialogue in that scene. Um, sorry, I'm being a bit mischievous here, but uh, we've known Monar for a long time, so I can get away with it. Um, so this is Chris Ryan's it is. novel, Strike Back. Yes. And is this is this the war correspondent finally <laughs> getting a chance coming this back is, to? This is <laughs> this is an <laughs> idle youth spent yeah. watching action movies when I was a kid. I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm an outright populist. I love making posh shows like The Crown, but I also love making posh shows like well, not not posh shows like Strike Back. Strike Back sells in 160 countries worldwide. It's in Series 6 right now. We're making Series 6. Oh, no, sorry. Finished Series 6. We're about to make Series 7. It's had three change of cast. It's Bill Clinton's favourite show and the King of Jordan's favourite show. And I get more... <laughs> thank you. It's with my world to... I mean, I know probably... I should think probably maybe five of you have probably watched Strike Back. I get that. I get that. How many people have seen Strike Back? Yeah, about five. five okay. but, yeah. It's a great yeah. show, I promise you. Uh, but it sells around the world, and, and it, was, it, was, it was a show I sold to Sky right at the very beginning of Left Bank's career, and it was an incredibly profitable show for us. It has literally powered Left Bank through the early years because action, uh, an action show, which is also kind of, I don't know, it's not funny, but it has a, yeah, I suppose it is quite funny. It's a, it, you know, it was based on the sort of lethal weapon type formula of action and, and comedy, a wryness to it. You know, it has the highest, someone, the, the, there was a survey on it, said that it had the highest body kill of any television show in the world. Great! 
That's fantastic. But of course, people don't die horribly. They die, just they just die, you know, and they're gone. You know, there's a little bit of blood, but no nastiness, you know. There was a review last week in America that said it was the biggest, it was one big pile of rhino jizz. <laughs> I'm getting it framed for the wall. I think it's fantastic. I, I... So, but, so did you... <laughs> Did you know, when you, kind of, when you went to sell it to Sky, were you thinking, this could be the, this could be, this could be the cash cow, this could be the thing that really bankrolls left no, bank? No, no, no. Did you I, ever think no, like that? I'm, I tell, I, I'll tell you very quickly the story. I was literally, this is how it happened. I went on a, I went to, Peter Morgan used to live in Austria, as I mentioned. I went up to um, Stansted Airport to go and see him. The plane was delayed, so I went into a bookshop, something I often do just to see if there's anything interesting, uh, ideas catch your eyes, a book you want to read while you're pissing around, you might make a show, who knows. Fucking great pile of books by this guy, Chris Ryan, strike back, strike back, strike back, headline, SAS rescue female reporter stuck in jihad, behind jihadist circles or something. I thought, sounds good, bang, put it in the bag, went to see Pete, came back again, and then I had a meeting in Sky about two or three weeks later, and I... Sky had never at that time commissioned any original drama, but I knew the, the lady who was the head of drama really well. I loved this. She was great. We loved having a cup of coffee and a gossip with her. Uh, and I remember getting up that morning thinking, oh, Christ, I'm seeing Elaine. What, oh, oh, she won't have anything to buy. But anyway, where's that book? It's a fucking book. So I dug it up and put it in the bag. Okay, I haven't read it, and I haven't bought the rights. <laughs> Off I go to Sky. We're nattering away, having a bit of a coffee, a bit of a gossip. Then she suddenly said, Andy, Andy, Andy. She said, great news, I've got money. I said, great, what for? She said. Popular books, got to be popular books, got to have a title, action if possible. Went, oh my God, I've got a great <laughs> book. <laughs> she said, what's it about? I said, you know, it's just, it's just, don't worry about the story, it's fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> she commissioned it on the spot, 10 hours. <laughs> seriously, but seriously. I'll never look back. And uh, this, I mean, this is a very, I mean, this is a very different, uh, I mean, in terms of, the challenges of production yeah. as, a, as a producer. I mean, the logistics of something like Strike Back yeah. are really quite. I mean, this is not two people having no. a phone call. You know, in sort of. You know, in, in you know, this is this is this is big stuff. This is blowing things up. Yeah. Yeah. This is helicopters on cranes and whatever. Isn't yeah. it? You know. So, but, I mean, how how do you? I mean. So when you, you pitched it to Sky, and then but then you still had to get Sky to pay for it. I yeah. mean, you still had to. This was not going to be a. This is not going to be a cheap show. It wasn't a cheap show, but we, the, first, the initial first series was just Sky, and then a, a, a stroke of luck happened, actually. Cause so it was, it, was a, it was relatively a reasonable... It was a UK budget, basically, for, for Series 1. Uh, and uh, at the end of Series 1, Richard Armitage was the lead, and uh, he was optioned as our, as, our, as our going forward. And then I got this call from his agent saying that Richard had been invited to meet a uh, well-known uh, New Zealand director who was in town. And, of course, it was just a cup of coffee, but you, you, did I have any objections to Richard going to the meeting? Or I was thinking, oh, Jesus Christ, obviously he's going to meet Peter Jackson. There's always, he's casting Lord of the Rings. Oh, my God. Anyway, of course, he gets offered Lord of the Rings, and I have to let him out. So I've, the sky have recommissioned the show. Armitage has gone. Andrew Lincoln was also in the first series, and he's gone off to do this little summer thing for six weeks only, something about the dead. So I've lost him too. <laughs> so I've got no cast, I've got a recommission. And just then, this is what happens, this is where a little bit of luck is always useful in your life. And in comes an American executive who has taken over a, 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 a channel called Cinemax, which was part of the HBO family. And HBO had realised that Cinemax was starting to lose out heavily to stars. So they charged this guy, they'd given him sort of 30 million bucks and said, go and find, commission some shows, get it, just get some production, get some original shows on Cinemax. So he flew into London, went into Sky, and said he was looking for some sort of populist, male-orientated, late-night kind of stuff. And they said, oh, we do, we do this show called Strike Back. And he rang me up and said, I love this show. Could we come on board? We could double the budget. So I suddenly got the Americans in and the thing. And we did, we, so we, had, we, we created a show with had a Navy SEAL and, a, a, and an SAS guy together fighting evil around the world. And we shoot it in, in, in tax break countries, mainly South Africa, sometimes Hungary. We're going to Malaysia next year. And, and off we go. Now that, actually, just quickly, was all shot in Jordan. And why was it shot in Jordan? Because I literally, this is God's honesty, got a phone call from a man who runs the film unit in Jordan and said, would I possibly come down to Jordan to meet a rather special person who was a bit of a fan? So I said, well, I, you know, I probed, probed a bit further. And then finally, he revealed it, that it was the king. Now, I assumed that when he said he was a big fan of my shows, that what he meant was he liked the queen and he liked, you know, all, this, all, all that. But it turned out it wasn't the queen and my royal stuff that he liked. It was Strike Back. It was his favourite show. 
So I, I flew down to Jordan to meet the king, which was a great honor, and he took me to uh, the special facility in Jordan where the uh, SAS, and Navy SEALs, uh, train along with the special forces of the Jordanian special forces who are among the best in the Middle East, as you can imagine. And at the end of this 15-minute firepower session that he laid on for me, he turned to me and said, it was a great privilege to have me in Jordan, and he was putting at, the, at, his, at my disposal the entire aircraft and army of the Jordanian uh, so providing I brought the strike back down to Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Who can refuse oh, wait, that? Exactly, exactly. You know. Boy, did we have some fun, I can tell you. So, um, we are, uh, we are uh, running out of time, but um, uh, 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 royalty has played quite a big part in your <laughs> career, I would say. It's in, weird, in, isn't it? In, in different ways. Um, I, I'm going to scoot straight to the, the, the final clip. Um, and then we'll, we'll come back and talk. So, so this, is, this, is a bit of a, this is a bit of a treat. This is a sneak preview of uh, season, uh, you have to call them seasons now, don't you? Se series two, as we call them in the UK, season two of The Crown, which uh, launches on December the 8th. December the 8th, yeah, yes. On Netflix. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, so I'm not quite sure which episode this is episode from. Episode two. This is from episode two. Philip so is on tour. Yeah. And Queenie's at home in yeah. Balmoral. And, or Sandringham, I think. Uh, yeah. And so let's just run the clip, please. Sit down, start it. Charles, come on. Now, come on, Dad. He's sent some notes to accompany the footage, so I'll read aloud. Hello, all of you. Hello. Hello, Daddy. Hello, Daddy. Hello. Uh, I can picture you all perfectly sitting there, wishing it was Creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, this is just boring old me arriving Look, that's not bad, is it? at King George Island. Henry. Look! A <laughs> hundred miles off the coast of Antarctica. There's your daddy. Oh. Is that daddy? And nestled between the white bones of ancient whales. Here we've made some new friends and Mike was rather smitten. Oh, He's got a beard. Yes, yes, they're, they're all growing beards. It makes them look a bit shifty. Oh, no, don't say that. It makes them look like an explorer. What's that? Oh, yes, yeah, this is very funny, Mummy. Um, we've even installed some signage so we can find our way home. Oh, Buckingham Palace. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. It's a bit of a commute to the office, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, luckily, we found some friends for company, the British hunting aero survey teams who make excellent tennis companions. Oh, look, no, look, they're all playing tennis. Isn't that silly? Uh, some things about huskies that you never knew. They have eyes of different colours. Oh, like the Kaiser. <laughs> but most of all, they really, really like tennis balls, as we can see that. And they have claws to ensure they don't slip on the ice. Oh, look, now he looks on one. Joining our family of animals are the penguins and seals who send their love to you all, as do I. Your loving papa and husband, Philip. Can't wait. <laughs> so um, I'm just watching the time. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to talk to you. I'd like you to talk a little bit about how um, uh, the thing, because we really want to know is how much does the crown really, really cost to make? Because there are lots of different estimates. Uh, I can tell you how yeah? much it does cost. Okay, so how much? It's five million pounds an hour. Five million pounds an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the reason that people get confused about with the price is because. It was, it was always described as £100 million, but it was £100 million for two series, and Netflix did not want to announce that they had commissioned a second series at the same time. So when we pitched it to Netflix, we said, it's three casts. We have a young queen, a middle-aged queen, and an old queen. We need you to commit to two series straight off, and, which they agreed to do. But they didn't want to announce they were committing to a second series because they thought it would be a terrible precedent for other producers. Oh, well, you did that for The Crown. Why did you not do it for us? But that's why people got so confused and said, oh, it's £10 million. Pounds. It's the most expensive television show ever. It's not. It's really, really. It's a lot cheaper than most of the HBO stuff. 
And, uh, you know, £5 million is certainly a lot more money than the BBC would normally pay or an ITV would pay. It's about twice, probably. But, and, that, and that's why it obviously looks really, really good, although we have also great technicians in this country. But it's, it's not hugely, hugely expensive. And, we, and, be, and before Netflix came on board, I mean, you had, you, you had thought about this show and you'd thought about it potentially as a BBC show, a yeah. BBC co-production, hadn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And then d what happened? Netflix kind of suddenly... So the world has changed. I mean, the great thing about your, if you're going into the media, you arrived at a fantastic time. The world has completely and totally changed. Streaming services have come on, tech companies have taken the world over. That is the truth. And in the end, the, out, the a whole orbit of television is changing. So what makes the, the crown perfect for Netflix is that they bought the crown at a time when they were about to go global. So we, I pitched a show along with Peter Morgan and Stephen Daudry, that uh, will probably be will probably have been made anyway, but it would have been it would have been difficult because we were really offering 60 hours of British history. Now, why would Americans want to make 60 hours of British history? HBO or Stars or any of these other companies we pitched to were interested in the show, but they didn't go for the show. They didn't turn it down, but didn't turn, didn't go for it either. But for Netflix, who are a global company, as Amazon and on YouTube and all the other new streamers, it's the global audience that they're interested in. And The Crown, as we know, is a brand. I mean, sorry, it sounds a little crude, but it, The Crown is, uh, the Royal, uh, the House of Windsor is a worldwide brand. And so we were offering, by chance, just because we happened to be at the right place at the right time, the right idea for a company that was about to roll this whole thing out. And is it also the case that, I mean, maybe this is with hindsight, but I mean, this is a series that is, I mean, this is a series which doesn't, it's not, it doesn't genuflect towards the royal family. It's kind of, you know, it's not, I mean, it, and as it becomes, I mean, we talked about Diana earlier. I mean, as a series, I mean, there is a sense of which the BBC might have struggled with I this I think series. they would have struggled. I think I, they would have struggled. I think the inevitable, the closeness of the BBC to the palace uh, would, have, would have caused problems. So we didn't even, we weren't actually able to get footage of the uh, coronation from the BBC. We were denied footage. The original footage of the coronation was denied to us. Um, uh, although if you watch episode five, you, uh, it appears to be that that is either footage taken from ITV or, or, or recreated by us. We, it's amazing what you can recreate. Philip is not, by the way, in Iceland. We did wreck it Iceland, but it was too expensive. He's in Leighton Buzzard in a quarry <laughs> with a lot of salt. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say you're still looking after the pennies. Oh, yeah. Five million pounds. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah have to have I assumed you just flown them to Antarctica. Okay, no, I'm not that on the head you know, straight away. Ice and salt. Okay, can we have the lights up? Because um, we've got about, well, maybe just under 10 minutes left. Um, uh, now, uh, I've got more. Well, really good. Okay, so uh, what I'd like you to do is, can you, if you want to ask a question, can you put your hand up? We have mics, so I want to get a mic to you. And so we'll have uh, the man in the blue, and then we'll have the uh, woman in the front row. OK. Yep. Hi, yep. it's Colin McRae from Edinburgh Napier University. Hi, Colin. Um, it's good to meet a fellow Bundle Boys fan, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not the Bundle Boys, I Yeah, guess. they're great. Yeah, the, one of them lives in Edinburgh now, actually. He still <laughs> performs. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, there you go. So come up to Edinburgh, listen to him. My question ties in to what you're saying about The Crown. I'm actually writing my dissertation yep. on... I'll read it out to you, the title. Um, how has the emergence of new distribution models, platforms and technologies impacted on the development process of quality scripted drama content in the UK? which is exactly what you're working in. So I'd right. ideally, I'd like to talk to you afterwards at some point, maybe yeah. sort of yeah. primary research. Right. But in that area with the Netflixes and the Amazons, et cetera, and possibly the Apples, what is the major opportunities for UK development companies, production companies? Hold that thought. Let's take another question so we can try and, and then we'll, we'll try and get you to do two for the price of one. Right. Hi, I'm Sophie. Hi, um, I'm interested in the research you did for the Queen when you said you went to all these people and talked to them. How easy or difficult was it to get information of them? How, how willing are they to share um, what they remember from the time? After As we know from the last seven days, politicians are so unbelievably leaky. It's, it's, it, <laughs> I promise you, for the price of a gin and tonic, you can get a hell of a lot of stuff out of a politician. <laughs> It, 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 and of course, it just wasn't the inner circle. But yes, there were a lot of players in the circle were, were, were talking to us. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like we were trying to do a stitch-up job. I mean, all you're trying to do is find out what the prevailing arguments were, and or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But no, no, people are generally very, very chatty to us, uh, and, and, and we don't pay them. We, we, it's only it's, you know, they don't have to. So it's, uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's, you'd be amazed how, how it talks to us. And, 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 and on the question of uh, the kind of, you know, the rise of the sort of streaming services and the new, I mean, there's been quite a lot re in the last, just in the last month. We've had Jane Featherston, uh, you know, doing a speech at yes. BAFTA. Yeah. We've had Tony Hall saying, you know, and, and, and the, the, the prevailing view seems to be that, you know, there is, 
And people seem to be quite anxious about this. They seem to think, you know, this is going to be, it's a bit like Google and Facebook, that actually these tech giants are going to take over and they want to own everything. I mean, they obviously want you to own, the, you know, they want to fully fund the crown and own everything. They want to, and so there's a kind of, I sense from what people are saying that there's a kind of, there's a fear that there they, is might a real really, fear. They, might, they might really shift the, the, I mean, what's your view? Are you yeah, optimistic I or pessimistic? No, I, I, I think, or, you know, I think uh, the, more, the more people that are in the business, the better it is for all of us, for all, for all of you, if you go into the media and for all of us when we're, when we're selling shows. Uh, I, you, you, clearly, there's a, an ongoing battle for the tech giants plus potentially between, you know, Amazon and, and Netflix and YouTube. You can see that ultimately that might lead to a decline in advertising for ITV, potentially, Channel 4, maybe. Sky, I think, have got different uh, pressures, and the BBC will survive as long as it has the money, and then long may it survive. I think we all need the BBC. Nobody wants, wishes uh, any major changes to the British industry. Um, I, I think Netflix can easily settle alongside. You know, people are only going to pay so much money. In this country, people are used to getting good quality television for nothing, and I, I can't see that that dis particularly disappearing. Netflix, one of the reasons that Netflix was so desperate to get the crown was to try and make inroads into this country. At the point that they bought the crown, the viewership of Netflix was very small, I understand. I mean, obviously, I've never really given facts and figures, but it was very, penetration was small. Pen Sky is successful in this country, but Netflix were not, uh, were not got much uh, impact. And the crown was a big number for them. Not just because it was of the subject, but because it was a, for an older audience as well. And driving an older audience was, was uh, important to them. Okay, we've got time for a, a couple more questions. Are there any more questions? For, uh, we got one there, Mike, and one down, and another one down here at the front. Thank you. Okay. Should I go? Um, hi, my name is Josephine, MOTVJ student from Goldsmiths, and I think I've got many questions, <laughs> so I'm trying. Um, first question is, what kept you going when you, when you graduated from university? What kept you going to continue to where you are right now? Like, I mean, you started somewhere, but now you are the head of a major company that's producing major movies and TV series. Like, what kept you going? Because I believe that when that's you started, you never, you would have thought that you'd be here right now <laughs> talking about um, pro I produced the Queen and you know the Crown. Like, yeah. And then, um, well, I think it's just an unbelief. You just have to have an undying belief that you that you that you that you've got something to say or something to do. You know, I I've had a really great career, but. But I, ju I never lack confidence. I mean, I have, I have had terrible times, I trust you. I won't, I won't bore you with them. But, you know, there have been terrible slumps where I haven't sold anything or, you know, I've lost jobs or it just, you know, it just doesn't quite go right. But I think at the end of the day, I think you have to have a great optimism and you have to, as a producer, if you become a producer, surround yourself or ally yourself, importantly, with great talent. And the key to my career as a scripted person has always been the relationships with the writers. Peter Morgan, 30-year relationship. Mike Bullen, who wrote Cold Feet for me. Nine series, Callahan, seven series, many others. So when I la when I f find a writer that I really relate to, whose work I really respond to, I, I just want to work with them. I, you know, I, I can work with many of them, but I mean, I but I just I, ha I have to have a kind of relationship with that writer, and I just want to take that you know, go forward with that writer. Okay. And the writers are the key. We are. I've got a question down here. I've got. I've probably got time for one more. There we go. I've got time for one more. So. Let's, let's take two questions together and then we'll see if you can... Uh, uh, um, I'm Josephine you. from Staffordshire University. It's yep. a bit of a simple question, really, yep. but what would you say out of all the kind of filming projects you've worked on, like, you're most passionate about? Okay. Uh, that's very hard. I, I, I'm, all, I'm passionate about everything. I, I can get equally excited watching Strike Back or being on the set of Strike Back as I can be watching Claire Foy being the Queen. It, it, you know, performance, writing... Um, but making things work just makes me very, very happy. Gen genuinely, you know, it gives me a great pride, basically. And one last question. Sorry, uh, uh, my second row. Thanks. Hello, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I'm doing a producing course at Royal Holloway, and you mentioned earlier producing is gambling. It's all coming down to judgment. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if you could speak more on what that is for you. Is that an instinctual, I like this, I think it'll work, or is it, I'm doing my market research, this has been selling, or I think this is what people want? How do you uh, that's find easy. that? I am totally, entirely instinctual. I, I, absolutely. I, you know, if it doesn't, go, it's, uh, if things don't grab me, I, I just can't do it. It, it, and I can't do things I'm not passionate about. I learned many, many years ago, and this is, I would suggest this is the case, if you don't, if you wouldn't watch the show, don't make it. That's, that's basically what I say. You know, I nearly became a drama director, and I, was, I, I got a job on the bill, and 
uh, and then I and I literally had a sort of moment where I think, hang on, I don't I don't like the bill. I don't watch the bill. Why the fuck do I want to direct it? <laughs> and it was a real moment. I suddenly I, I just don't want to do that. I actually and the, as a producer, you know, whichever way you want to go. If you're a, a obsessive sort of person, then directing is uh, you know if you're singular, if you have a singularity of vision, a director is a great place to be. I don't have a singularity of vision. I am equally at home with half a dozen different things, and that's what I like, you know. But but it, each to their own. That's what's great about the business. It requires so many different bits of the talent. Um, can I tell the story about Mika? Have we oh, got time? Yeah. You like absolutely. to tell the story? Yeah, I, just, I, I just want to tell this story because you're all young and this is, uh, I think, a rather inspiring story. About a year ago, I think, a year, 15 months ago, so I have to leave you A young lady came to our office as part of the di a diversity scheme that we, that we sign up to. And uh, she was half Welsh and half Japanese. And she was a really interesting lady called Mika. And within a, a month or so, it was quite clear that Mika was incredibly bright and very smart, very interested in television, and, uh, and was perfect, not just beyond the scheme, but to, to, to have a full-time job. And we gave her, quite quickly, a full-time job as a script editor. And she started to go into meeting with writers and all that. I mean, our process is obviously a writer comes in, pitches idea, or we have idea, writers come in, and then you work with the ideas in an intense yeah, over a couple of hours every week, that sort of thing. So she was going into these kind of meetings. And then we discovered that she was writing. At the weekends, she was writing comedy scripts. She was only 24, 25 at this point. And uh, so we thought this was interesting. We read the scripts, thought it was good. She had, clearly had promise. And obviously, she really wanted to be a writer. She was really going through the production process just to understand how television companies worked, how stuff got commissioned, how producers and script editors work. And then... A few months later, Sky announced that they wanted, uh, were looking for a space show. They were looking for what they described as a space opera, and they invited various companies to submit ideas or, you know, for, for this project. So we discussed this in the office, and Mika said, "Oh, I, you know, I'm really interested in space. I'm really interested in being a genre, you know, in genre. Uh, I'd love to have a crack at this." So we decided just to give her the money to write a script. So we so didn't have an agent or anything. Else. We just gave her, I don't know, whatever it was, twenty grand, and I gave her a month off and said, "Look, go home and have a crack at your script, and then you know, finish it off at the weekends." And over, anyway, over a month, a few months, she produced this really rather wonderful script, and uh, we pushed her a bit harder to get a bit further on the Bible. We sent it into Sky, turned it down. Sent it off to Channel Four, turned it down. So I didn't really quite know what to do with it, so it ended up I put, I put it in the bottom drawer. Meanwhile, Mika, very sensibly, had sent the script out to agents, got herself a very good agent, and then left, because quite quickly that script landed on various other producers' uh, desks, and they read this, oh, it was great, she sounds great, and she went into the room on Troy, which is a new BBC Netflix show, and Night Manager 2, and various other things, and she quite rapidly, because it's a small pool in this country, became a very hot writer. It's, I'm talking months here. And then suddenly I got a call from WME, which is one of the biggest agencies in uh, LA, and who, who helped to look after us and help represent us in the, in the States. And the agent who works with us said, Andy, Andy, hey, 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 I'm looking for genre. You got any genre shows? Because there's a real demand for genre here. I said, well, I've got a great space show, actually, in, in, actually to be honest with you, but it's a, it's a little known writer and with no credits. She said, oh, and that's very hard in the States. Anyway, I said, she said, well, send it over. She said, anyway, I sent it over. She read it, said it was great, sent it to a couple of producers who also loved it. And very briefly, it was uh, going to um, be set up at ABC. And I rang Mika and I said, I know this is a bit bizarre, but it's, en it's ended up at ABC and it might end up as a network pilot, which is a bit strange, but, you know, if it, you know, great if you get it. She says, okay, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. So anyway, it didn't go at ABC, but a couple of days later, the agent rang me back and said, YouTube were commissioning drama. I went, really? Okay, fine. I said, well, send it over to YouTube. Ah, two days later, YouTube, these young executives rang up, did a conference call and said, we really love this script. Uh, we want a commission. We want to go straight to 10. When can you start? <laughs> now, this doesn't really, really doesn't happen very often, I can tell you. I mean, I know I've done The Crown, and that was pretty good, but this was pretty extraordinary. So I rang Mika. She's such a millennial like you lot. So I rang Mika, and I said, Mika, I've got extraordinary news for you. I've just, I've just done a conference call with YouTube, and they really want to do this. And you need to go to LA next week with one of our producers to get the whole thing going. She went, oh, you know, it's sort of not where my head is anymore. I've sort of just sort of, <laughs> I've just sort of moved on. I said, Mika, 
there's $40 million on the table here. I said, you get over to left bank as soon as you can, please. <laughs> Bang! Brilliant. Anyway, and I... it's going, it's going. We, we start shooting in South Africa in, in, in a month's time, and as she, Mika, 27, has organised a writing room, all British writers. She refused to go to Los Angeles. She said, I'm only going to do it if I work here. I want writers my age. I'm going to do it. I'm going to knock it out of the park. And I have to tell you, three scripts in, it's really, really great. And she's Fantastic. astounding story. Can I just do a quick poll again? I just want to ask after that last hour. Um, <laughs> how many people uh, now would like to work in television drama? Uh, yeah! Boy, it's a lot more. Um, listen, uh, we've slightly run over, but I think it was worth hanging on for Mika's uh, story, which is a fantastic uh, way to end. Um, but can I, before you go, can I ask you to put your hands together for Andy Harris?